Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, we have a very special guest who has agreed to take some time out of his busy schedule to tell us about his experience with the group Nexium, N-X-I-V-M or I-U-M, that has been in the news recently and involves some well-known Hollywood celebrities, Allison Mack, and it was headed by a man named Keith Ranieri, and out of New York, uh, kind of centered in Albany, New York. But uh, this gentleman, his name is Frank Parlato. He's done a lot. He's had personal experiences with Nexium, and also has been writing about Nexium for uh, at least three years, uh, na- notably on his excellent blog titled "The Frank Report" that you can find online. And he's really kept an eye on this. But uh, Frank, are you there? Uh, yes, I am, William. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I think that this is an important subject, and uh, I know that you have firsthand information about Nexium. So maybe you could start by just uh, going through your background, people who don't know you, and how you became within the orbit of this group. Well, um, I'm a publicist and a journalist, and I was retained by uh, the group Nexium back in 2007 to be their publicist. And back in 2007, they were just beginning to attract some adverse publicity. People in the media were calling them a cult. And they denied that vehemently and asked if I might be able to help them put out some stories that would show they were really a life coaching, success teaching type of um, company that provided a very special educational program. Okay, and uh, and how did that? How did your relationship continue after two thousand seven? Well, it started off splendidly, and um, what I did was I moved to Albany to work closely with the group, and it was funded by two young ladies, uh, Claire and Sarah Brothman, and that name may be familiar to some of your listeners as it is a famous name connected with the ownership of the Seagram's Liquor Company and these two heiresses, Claire and Sarah, in their early 30s were members of this group Nexium. Okay. And, and they were obviously, yes. I was just going to say, please continue. Oh, they... Uh, they were very dedicated to the company, and they were funding the company, and they paid my um, salary, and uh, I found them to be very, very sincerely devoted to the leader of this group, next to him, his name, as you mentioned earlier, Keith Ranieri. Okay, and what, what, time, what was he teaching back then in 2007? What was the external kind of... Uh you know, self-help type of materials that he was providing to the public? He provided a, he provided a high-intensity course uh, that would extend for anywhere from 5 to 16 days. It was a, a, not an inexpensive course. It would run anywhere from uh, $2,000 to $20,000 a course, depending on the type of course it was. And they, were, they started at 7 a.m. They lasted till 10 p.m. And they were called intensives. And the, the idea was to teach people certain life skills and critical thinking, to look at the world in a way that might be uh, a new way of thinking and something that would promote their success both on the outside and on the inside. Health and um, financial success. And, and there was even a little taste of spirituality to, uh, to try to be a more ethical, more noble person. This is how it was sold on the outside. And were they, they well attended? Support. Were they well attended? No, not, not well attended, but there was, they, they searched for the type of student, William, that was going to be a long-term kind of a member. So they might have 10 to 30 people in the class, but since they were $10,000 per class courses, they were bringing in money. I see. And uh, then how did how did your public relations relationship continue with Nexium? 
Well, it started off splendidly. Um, I got them, I landed some good stories, placed a number of good stories, and for the first time they were getting publicity that didn't include the word cult. And from the outside, it struck me that this group was actually, uh, they might be a little eccentric, they might have a different point of view, but they were entitled to live without being castigated or chastised or criticized at every turn. So I, so I began to achieve some success for them, and they brought me in closer to work on more projects. <clears throat> and I noticed that they were a litigious group. They were suing their enemies. I see. And who, there was kind of a, who were their enemies at that time? Were they ex-members? Uh, ex-members, ex-girlfriend, and a, a cult buster by the name of Rick Ross who had publicly condemned them as a cult. Okay. Former consultant by the name of Joseph O'Hara. Uh, Chris, Kirsten Gillibrand's, um, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand's father, Doug Rutnick. Doug Rutnick, right. Uh, he settled pretty quickly, so he didn't stay on the enemies list. He quickly gave them $100,000 and ducked out of the scene. I see. And so then, so you realize that they were a litigious group, and this was being funded by the two Bronfman, Bronfman sisters, correct? Right, at more than a million dollars a month in legal fees. <clears throat> I see. So I, 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 I advised them, I said, look, all of these uh, litigation matters are not going to be very productive for a group that's trying to say it's not a cult and a group that's trying to say we're a positive life coaching uh, company. Right. They didn't seem too interested in that, so I urged them to settle, and then I... Uh, before we really got too much further, it came to me as a surprise one day. Uh, just after I had <clears throat> publicized a concert that featured Allison Mack, Kristen Kruk, and Nikki Klein in Albany, uh, they came to me, the high rank of Nexium, Ranieri and his chief lieutenant at the time, Nancy Salzman, <clears throat> and in effect they said, we need $5 million for a project that we're doing out in Los Angeles, California. I see. What was that, what was that project? Well, it was strange and it got stranger. The $5 million they needed was for a real estate project in Los Angeles, California. Keith had been guiding the Brothman sisters in a Los Angeles project to, to build million-dollar-plus homes in Los Angeles County on hillside lots. Okay. And I was a little surprised that the Brothmans would need me to fund them. And that's when I discovered that the Brothmans had sustained some very substantial losses. And what were those losses pertaining to? They were Keith's guided investments. In retrospect, I realize now he was swindling them. But at the time, I thought that there was just some blunders. Um, I went to California to check out the project, and I found that there was $10 million that had been invested out of t a total $26 million that never made it into the project. Looking a little farther, I noticed that the properties that they had in, uh, purchased weren't even in their name. So I uh, quickly confronted Ranieri's partner, and persuaded him to sign over the properties to the Brothmans. And then I uh, recovered the other $10 million. So I recovered $26 million for the Brothmans. And um, I was wondering where the other $65 million that was missing went to. And they informed me they had um, invested in commodities under Keith's direction in the commodities market. And all sixty-five million dollars had disappeared. Wow! Did you believe that that's true? That that disappearance into the so-called commodities market is that authentic loss, or could that have been some type of laundering? It was some kind of laundering that these two Brothman sisters got swindled out of their money. Ranieri laundered it from them to, to from them to him. I see. But what, and this is what got me fired is I. I approached Claire Brothman, and they, after all, were paying my salary, not Ranieri. And I said to Claire, you know, $65 million has been lost in the commodities market. 
I did an investigation. I recovered $26 million for you. I think I'll start an investigation. Let me see if I can recover some of the $65 million. I see. And I said, do you know for a fact where the $65 million went? Did you, did you invest in orange futures or wheat or cotton? And she says, I, I know nothing. I trust Keith. He handles everything. Wow, that's remarkable. I said to her, uh, well, suppose uh, we look into it. And she said, well, I know what happened to the money. I said, what's that? And she said, my father, Edgar Brothman Sr., he was the head of the World Jewish Congress and the CEO formerly of Seagram's, a billionaire. She said, my father, he is so against me being with Keith that he manipulated the entire commodities market to... Uh, divest, us, divest us of this money. That's what Keith said, and Keith would know. I see. Wow. So that's kind of like a cult technique to alienate the children from the parents, too, right? Uh, do you think, I think that? So. Okay, that sounds like that to me. I, I, can, I, I don't know. Wow. So there's a significant amount of money floating around. And do you think that that investment in Los Angeles was also another? you know, laundering scheme to swindle the Bronfen, Bronfen sisters? I, I most certainly do, and I spoiled, Keith's, I spoiled Keith's plan by swooping down and investigating it so quickly. He had to, of course, pretend that, um, that he was on my side. As I recovered this money for the Bronfens, what could he say? Wow. <clears throat> but he, he thought to get rid of me and get rid of me, he did. When I began to look deeply into the $65 million lost in commodities, he fired me. And he had enough sway over his gullible Brothman sisters that they <clears throat> supported that firing. Did you get paid through Nexium, or were you paid individually from the Bronfman sisters? I was paid by the Bronfman sisters. Interesting. Wow. That's even that. Okay, and then, so now, now you've been fired. This is 2007, correct, or 2008? 2008. 2008. And Kristen Croik, Allison Mack, and I guess this woman who's supposedly Allison Mack's girlfriend, Nikki Klein, were married, were all involved even back then in 2008. Well, yes, they were very involved. Oh, okay. So they've had at least 10 years of some kind of involvement. However, Allison Mack, definitely 10 years. So that $5 million they wanted from you, and and then you got fired, and then and then what happened? Well, uh, I was prepared to go my own way. And just to complete the picture, when I recovered the $26 million, they, um, there was, we, made a, we made a contractual arrangement that I would help them develop the properties. This is before I was fired. Gotcha. And um, there were certain financial arrangements made. When I was fired, uh, Keith Ranieri said, I want all of the money back that, you were paid and the bonus that you were paid for recovering the 26 million you're done. And you're not only done, you're returning all of the money. And if you don't return the money, you're going to have a legal battle. You won't believe. And I have a lot more money to spend than you do. I see. And so did that eventually lead to a lawsuit? Oh, it's most assuredly did. And we were in, in thick in, we're thick in the battle of uh, fighting, and um, still to this day, 2018. Yeah, although he's been slightly hampered now that he sits in the <laughs> Brooklyn Metropolitan Detention Center. <laughs> well, right, well said. So, I mean, just for the public, if they don't know, Keith Ranieri <laughs> and Allison Mack were arrested in Mexico. Well, actually, Ranieri was arrested first in Mexico, and then Allison Mack. I don't know where they, they found her. Was she in New York, or did they arrest her in Mexico? Extradite her from Mexico. She was arrested in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, right. Okay, so she was in Brooklyn. And then she paid a $5 million bail, got an ankle bracelet. I think she was seen in California yesterday or the day before and is, is under house arrest. And Ranieri, I think he was denied bail, and I think his hearing was today. Is that correct? No, it was postponed till uh, next week, next Friday. Gotcha. So. He, he has not made a bail application, and it's not believed that he could obtain bail because he, number one, he fled to Mexico, and number two, he's charged with sex trafficking. It's his, uh, 
you know, he presents a, I think in most people's minds and probably in any judge's mind, a very clear danger to the community. Yeah, I saw that the uh, U.S. attorney wrote a very compelling argument for why he should not be let out on any bill. I, I think that I'll be surprised if they let him out if he's already fled to Mexico. So it would be a judge who was willing to risk being defrocked because I think Ranieri would probably, if he ever got out of prison, I think he would find or try with the Brofman money to flee to a non extraditing country. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think that the, I think he was, he was, he was arrested on three different charges, but there may be additional charges for that guy. There may be more trouble as long. I know that the, Attorneys of the FBI sent out a notice looking for any additional uh, victims of Ranieri. So there may be other people talking. And if Mac is talking, she probably, if she's been in the group for 10 years, she probably knows, you know, uh, quite a bit more than the public. She knows quite a bit. And I have provided the um, authorities with a large cachet of financial tax evasion, bulk cash smuggling, foreign corrupt practices, double sets of bookkeeping, um, illegal um, immigration kind of fraud. So I've given them identity theft. I've given them a large cachet. And, of course, I don't want to take credit for this. The FBI in New York City has done their own independent investigations. And I believe there will be superseding indictments. I see. Yeah, I would agree. definitely agree with that. So, Allison Mack, they, they go back 10 years. Um, <clears throat> what's been, what, what, uh, what happened in the interim before you started kind of blogging intensely in 2015 and, and when you were left the group in 20, 2008? I, tr- I went on my own. When I, you know, I went my own way, I should say. I hope to just avoid, um, I was prepared. I, I set aside the money that I was uh, given as a bonus which, you know, was $1 million, recovered $26 million, and um, was not uh, disproportionate to Brofman's mind or Ranieri's mind at the time when I was rescuing a um, real estate project that had gone muck, covered $26 million in assets. Yeah, it's less than 5%. Less than 5%, right? So then, you know, as I said, when I left, Ranieri wanted all of the money back, every penny I'd been paid. And I refused to do it. I put the money in escrow. And I awaited the day ever when they would sue me, which, of course, they did. That's a long story, but the upshot of it is is that when I saw how egregiously they perjured themselves, it then became necessary for me to expose this cult for what it really was, a lying criminal organization. And at at the time, I did not truly realize how how despicable they were. I didn't know, for example, that Ranieri was a pedophile. And I didn't know that at the time that he had sex slaves. I knew he had a harem, Mm -hmm. but it seemed to me that it was consensual. And if people, if women and men are comfortable in their relationships, I'm not going to judge them. Well, I didn't know then about the pedophilia. I didn't know then about the branding or the blackmail. Right, the collateral, what he called the collateral. What he calls the collateral, right. Well, that's interesting. I mean, that's the interesting thing about Ranieri is he seems to have dodged um, getting getting, uh, arrested for pedophilia going back. 15, 20 years, his, his, his business before Nexium was, what is it? Something buy online. What was the name of it? it was consumer byline. Is that right? That is correct. Consumers byline. Consumers byline. So that was kind of a multi-level marketing scheme that he, uh, he was, I think, a, I think he had to pay out certain things after there was a criminal investigation. If my memory serves me correct. So then he went from it was, that. It was a, yeah, he had to pay a fine. That's right. But I think that multi-level marketing mentality morphed into the next iteration of what that was is into Nexium. So you have this kind of mark. He's he's claimed or near. He's claimed to have like a two forty IQ, and that he, uh, you know, could speak in full sentences when he was one. So he has this kind of uh, 
personal mythology that's very similar to L. Ron Hubbard's. But, uh, yeah, there's some very dark stuff that was going on in Nexium that, uh, I mean, there's, I, and you've put it in your articles, there were at least two girls who came forward about their testimony that he statutorily raped them. Um, so <clears throat> I don't know if that's going to be brought up in this criminal, tr- you know, this in 2018, but those women have been on the record and he, I, I read, and I think it was in one of your articles that he had 57 women as his slave. Is that correct? At least. At least. Okay. And <clears throat> I found it interesting too, that he, ha- he tried to make it as a multi-level marketing scheme, his whole sex slavery thing, where he would have. Uh, broke it down into 666, a per- very uh, odious, you know, scary number. But he said, you know, it was him. Then he would have six slaves, and each one of them would get six. And so it would, you know, pyramidize out there in a kind of pyramidal structure. Um, but he had this thing called DOS, the vow. And in Latin, it was Dominus Obsequious Sororium, or Master Over Slave Women. Can you talk more about that? Yeah. Uh- it was it was kind of an interesting. Uh, it's kind of um, a very fascinating uh, evolution of Re- of Ranieri's uh, life and his um, his need to both uh, control people and satiate his uh, sexual appetites. He um, he priorly he had a harem. And when I was there, it appeared to me that the harem was mainly voluntary. He preferred women that were very slender with long hair. He did not allow women to cut their hair. And they, if they gained one or two or three pounds, they would be put uh, on the sidelines, temporarily kicked out of, the, out of the harem until they lost their weight again. So if you were a five-foot, five-inch woman, and you were more than 100 pounds, you were to be punished. And many a woman were punished for gaining one or two excess pounds and literally shunned. But at least they were voluntary at the time, or, you know, if you believe in brainwashing, they were semi-brainwashed but not uh, violently coerced or blackmailed into doing this. Somewhere along the line, he probably around 2015, he was losing his ability to get voluntary women who were in their 20s to want to be with this 55-year-old cult leader. And so he devised a new method which would get his slaves, present slaves, to move forward to bring in new slaves of the young and uh, tender age type and get them in where they were, uh, there was blackmail worthy material hanging over their heads so that they could be indoctrinated as his sex slaves um, and couldn't ever leave. Right, so that's that was kind of the whole invention of this collateral notion, is that right? Yeah, partly and also, yeah, to have young slaves, to have can continue to have young slaves and also to create a system where he could uses coercive methods without having to make any significant effort to woo, cajole, flatter, court. Uh, he would just give the orders, and the girls would have to obey. Wow. And so Allison Mack, I think they just came out in Vanity Fair that she, uh, in her her attempt to recruit women, I think she she went after Emma Watson, Kelly Clarkson, some other people that you know, and 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 and, and it seems like the it was the the cell of the sugar coated cell that to get into this group that is a, you know a self help. Oh, that's right. I think part of his group was that DOS or the Val was a women's only club, right? So isn't that what they said to the external outside world yeah. is that this is like a women's club? It, it's safe. It's safe. Yeah, right. there's no men in it, but there was just one man in it. One man. That's a very and he required all of the women to be celibate too, right? So they couldn't, they weren't supposed to date anything, anybody but Keith Raniere, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's always, that was always his policy from his days of a voluntary harem, was the, the, he could sleep with any woman, but they all had to be only with him because as he, um, as he taught, 
his uh, spiritual energies were so subtle, profound, and intense that if any other man's vibration touched these women, it would could affect him in such a negative way that he could, in fact, die. Oh, right. That's right. I mean, I think he told. I think he told one girl. If I wrote it down, was he told her their union would make her see a blue light? I think I got that from your blog or one of the postings you had. But yeah, it's a spirit yeah. experience. Transference of godlike energy was another phrase. So he uh, he definitely had his lines with the women. Yes, he was. He and he promised them all um, <clears throat> motherhood, and it told them to keep it a secret. But <clears throat> each of them he promised that they would have his avatar child. Right. That's amazing. And then there was one, I think there was a semi-famous uh, Christiana Loken who possibly has his child. She was one of the Terminators in one of the later Terminator films. But uh, she has a child possibly by, by Ranieri. Is that correct? Well, it's certainly a possibility. You can't rule it out. Um, she's never identified who the child is. It's known, uh, and, and you know we're likely both to be sued for this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've already been threatened by her. Oh, okay. I didn't <laughs> but the truth is a defense. But the answer is yes. Uh, she's known to be a member of the group, and yes, she has a child. She had the child. She has not identified who the father is. Gotcha. I'm not saying it. People. Right. I'm not saying it's Renary's yeah. father. Just I, that was speculation. <laughs> Pure speculation. Um, if you're not alone in that. You're, you're not alone because many people in the cult have told me that that's what they believe. Whether it's true or not, a DNA test could uh, provide us with. Were there answer. were there other members of the harems or the groups or DOS who also had children by Ranieri? Do you know? Yes, and it's curious because um, because um, because. Uh, the uh, he had one child in 2006, and he did not want to admit to the group that that was his child. So he created an elaborate lie, and he denied the fatherhood of his own child. Uh, there was probably eight or ten abortions, and. Um, in the group, the first time he ever. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say the group has its own doctor, isn't that right? There was a doctor associated with the group, Brandon There's Porter. Two doctors. Okay, then the Brandon Porter I remember I think is one. There's Dr. Brandon Porter, and then there is Dr. Danielle Roberts. Dr. Roberts is the woman that did the actual physical branding, human branding of the women. I see, and that was the that was putting in these initials on. I mean, according to some of the stuff you wrote on your blog, it was very close to their um, their genitals. I mean, the female genitals, not far away at all. Like, because the, yeah. the, the what's uh, publicized is that it looks like yeah, it's uh, close to like the belt line of their body, you know. But some of those, wow, that's pretty scary and painful. Uh, yes, well, the, the, the Veneri's egomaniacal uh, nature required the branding of women with his initials on their pubic region. Yeah, it's remarkable. I mean, and then, yeah, and then there's other, so he had this harem. He's also, I think I remember seeing on a video, he said, I've had people killed because of my beliefs or because of their beliefs in 2009. That was posted on YouTube. Has there been any type of, have you heard of anything about threatening language or anything like that? He's always a threatener. And I believe, William, that at least two women were killed by him. And would you want it? Was it Christian Steider and Gina Hutch Hutchinson? Are those the names? Yes, that is correct. So let's talk about Christian Steider. She uh, was in. The, the, the odd thing about the group is that it's headquartered in Albany, but it also has a Mexico arm. There's some things going on in Alaska. California. Does that sound right? Are there any other outposts? Yes. So uh, an outpost will spring up anywhere they could get it. Vancouver, okay. Los Angeles, San Francisco, in their heyday, Mexico City, Guadalajara, Leon, Monterey, 
uh, New Zealand, Australia, London, any place where uh, several people would gather to learn, they would try to get a center going. Some were more successful than others. Some were just for the occasional course. Gotcha. Kristen Snyder was a lesbian woman who uh, started taking the courses in 2002. And Ranieri always had a, a, a theory that he could do, uh, what do they call that, conversion therapy. Right, changing somebody changing. from gay, yeah. And he, he, was, um, he was fascinated with the idea of uh, converting lesbian women to heterosexual women through the power in his uh, savoir-faire and his mentoring in, a, in the bedroom. And he took on Kristen Snyder and, and rather surprised her. He told her he would teach her, and it wound up going into the bedroom, and the next thing she knew, she was pregnant. I see. A gay woman who got pregnant by surprise. And she had a, wasn't she have a, like a live-in girlfriend or was she married? I don't rec recollect that. Yeah, she was actually married. married. Uh, she had gone through, I don't know if it was it got a legally recognized marriage, but she had gone through a ceremony and she recognized her, her mate as her, her spouse. And she didn't know how to break the news to her spouse that she was pregnant with, the leader of this group that both her and her spouse were attending classes for. And she then started to reveal this secret here and there. And when it reached the peak where she was telling other people in the Nexium community, she one day disappeared, never found again. And the authorities in Alaska very curiously rushed to the conclusion that she had committed suicide and her body had disappeared. I think their position was she took, she was a kayaker. She took a kayak out onto uh, <clears throat> an inlet of the ocean and then flipped it over and committed suicide, which is very strange. Very strange. Her body was never found. There's many more curious and suspicious circumstances surrounding this whole disappearance that has never been fully, uh, it's a cold case waiting to be reopened. It had become quite cold because Ranieri had moved on, but now that um, things have changed and he's in jail, he's less of a threat. But I think the Brothman spent more than $600,000 covering up this crime for Ranieri. And how did they, how did they spend that money? Where did it go to? Well, I know they hired some uh, supposedly ex-CIA um, agents to handle uh, the Kristen Snyder matter. And uh, the main idea was to, I think, first of all, persuade the Alaskan authorities that she was suicidal. There was nothing to, there was nothing to investigate. And then there was a... Um, a, a, a new twist, which was Kristen Snyder was supposedly alive and hiding somewhere in various different... She was spotted, much like Elvis, spotted in different uh, cities. And, of course, she never really was identified by anybody. I'm convinced, so is her sister, so is her mother, so is her former spouse, that she is dead. And she was murdered. Well, nobody knows for oh, sure, right. but one troubling thing happened. The last person to see her alive told me, she said, for 15 years this has been on my conscience. And I finally have to tell somebody. I was the last person to see her alive. And there's no way that she was in a condition on the day that she disappeared to drive four hours from Anchorage, Alaska to Seward, Alaska and Resurrection Bay steal a kayak, take it out on the water, paddle it out without a coat or anything in February in Alaska and tip her canoe over. I don't believe she could have possibly 
done the deeds that the police concluded she did. Physically, she would have been incapable of doing it. Yeah, that's a hyper sketchy story, Kristen Snyder. And the other one was Gina Hutchinson. That was in New York, is that correct? Correct. And can you tell more about that? Uh, Gina Hutchinson was a statutorily raped girlfriend of uh, Keith Ranieri when Keith was a uh, young rapist of 23, 25 years of age. He, uh, he snatched Gina from a life of high school and um, moving forward in her own little world, in her own life, um, he, he promised to marry her. She was 15. He raped her. Then he raped her, um, her friend and then some of her other friends. And one day she found out that he had a whole harem of 14 and 15 year old girls. It shocked her. It depressed her. She, she wanted to leave. He kept her in. He promised her babies and uh, a new life. And she hung in, she hung out. She hated being in the harem, but he had his methods of keeping her in. She of course became a young lady and then a woman and at the age of 30, she began to be a little rebellious with Keith Ranieri, and he uh, um, <clears throat> brought her into town and had a chat with her. She seemed to be uh, perturbed. She took a hotel near Ranieri's house, and five very slender women, one of them a little older than the rest, made a visit to her the night before she was to die. And I'm not sure precisely what the purpose of their their visit late at night at the hotel. But the next day, she disappeared. And the following day, her body was found in Woodstock, New York. She had been shot in the head. Once again, the authorities concluded that she had pulled the trigger on herself, based in large part on evidence that Ranieri's women gave that the woman, Gina Hutchinson, was quite unsettled. But I believe that he either killed her, had her killed, or talked her into committing suicide. Yeah, that's a really unusual, very, um, men and women, when they try, when they decide to end their lives, go through the process in very different ways, and women almost never use a gun. So whenever you hear about a woman shooting herself, uh, really unlikely, just off the top of my head, but she was found, like, on the water, too. Was she found in the water or on the river, on the water bank? She was found alongside a pond in Woodstock near a Buddhist temple that she would often go to hide from Ranieri when he was particularly brutal. Gotcha. Yeah, have and you... I don't know for a fact that they were both murdered, but I, I think that he had a hand in their deaths. And there may be others we don't even know about. Have you followed any of the posts about Nexium on the website Crazy Days and Nights? No, I haven't. Yeah, they've been they've been reporting a lot on Nexium and Allison Mack, and they've had some very incredible. I mean, they actually predicted Weinstein and Kevin Spacey even before they you know everything was outed, but they've said some very stuff, uh, terrifying stuff about that whole group. That I'm not. I don't want to talk about in public, but I'll talk to you offline. But it's uh, the, if those are true stories, it's very very dark. The underneath the, the, the cover of Nexium, it's some very dark stuff. Well, there's nothing dark that Ranieri wouldn't embrace. <clears throat> I, I, te I tend to doubt, because I'm pretty close to a lot of the defectors, I tend to doubt there was any wide-scale Pizzagate, pedo, pedo gate, or like there was a major trafficking thing, but we can't rule it out entirely. His connections with the Mexican... Uh, upper level elite, uh, conspiratorial drug running, pedophiles is established. Right, but and, he, I mean, uh, one of the people in his group was the son of a former president, right? Emiliano Salinas. Um, so who more, I came out and said he quit. One. More than one, okay. But also, there was connect, yeah, there's connections between them and bringing in, I can't remember the story, I think I read it in yours, about somebody being up in Albany who was an illegal immigrant, right? So they're like bringing people. many, yeah, many, 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 many cases of illegal immigrants taken from Mexico, traffic. There were children that were brought in who were 11, 12, 13, 14 years old that, that um, had curious circumstances and then were rushed out of 
Albany. There were women imprisoned from Mexico. Uh, there's uh, many, many stories. It's only the tip of the iceberg. How widespread, how commercial it was, I don't know. Much of it seemed to be just to pander to Ranieri's own enormous uh, manipulative uh, sexual predatory desires. So he didn't have like an inside group like some of these other cult leaders of men. It seems like almost everybody on this list is, I mean, there's maybe a few men, it seems like more like, you know, 75% women, 25% men. I would say it's maybe 80-20. At one time there was a group of men who were paying fees to learn from them from Ranieri, and they were called the Society of Protectors. After I broke my story about the branding, because that had been withheld from the men, when I broke the story back in June 2017, less than a year ago, the men, almost every man quit the organization. Wow. And they had funny, they have different nicknames inside, like uh, Ranieri's Vanguard, his second in command is, or Nancy Salzman's prefect. Like, there's all, uh, did they all have internal, like, gang, almost no. like gang names? No, no. Um, Ranieri might give him a nickname. He called one woman Ya and another K and so forth, but only two of them had official names. Uh, Ranieri himself, who, as you said, was named Vanguard. And Nancy Salzman, who was his useful idiot, uh, purported second in command, but really just the stooge, um, she was called prefect. Gotcha. <clears throat> what? And she? I mean, I think you wrote she was a hypnotist and neurolinguistics programming expert. How much of that do you see integrated into Nexium and Keith Ranieri's uh, behavior? A, a, a constant, consistent, universally used. And when that doesn't work, he uses coercion. I see. So he's definitely using NLP, you think? Oh, 100%. And, and Nancy, that was what attracted uh, him <clears throat> to her, because she is a expert at it, and she's completely um, obedient to his ever crazier demands. That's interesting. And I saw that you wrote something about a technique that um Ranieri would use that was that Hubbard would use as well this whole uh confusion what do you call it the confusion approach right right so like like flip somebody's desires come back with something else yeah I mean it's it's really the parallels between Scientology and this group seem to be pretty pronounced I mean pretty obvious uh, he was deeply influenced by Scientology and he even um, hijacked a number of their terms like uh, suppressive and parasite. Oh, I didn't so know forth. that. I didn't know that. Oh, that's interesting. Maybe what we can talk about too is all of the. I mean, he seems to have wanted, kind of like Scientology, get celebrities involved. Scientology has that celebrity center, so he has a lot of celebrities and also wealthy people and people of political, you know, power. I mean, you want to go through some of these lists, like the Carlos Salinas or other people. There was Rosa Junco who's the daughter of a billionaire. Right. Right, right. He, um, you know, there was three types of recruits that he had in, an interest in, wealthy people or powerful people, uh, attractive women, and then he did like um, the worker bees. A woman or even a man didn't necessarily have to be a spectacularly good-looking person or even wealthy if they were going to work full-time for no pay or little or no pay for the uh, cult. So the powerful and rich included, of course, first and foremost, the Brothman sisters. Because they would give him any amount of money and they would do any destructive thing he asked them to do, whether it was sue a person and perjure themselves in court, file false criminal charges, um, pay for private investigators to hunt down enemies and find where they were in hiding. Yeah. Um, That's right out of the Scientology was, playbook, yeah. <clears throat> then there was the murderous son of the murderous father, Carlos Salinas, the former president of Mexico and the world's maybe most dangerous criminal, who heads up the drug cartels that feed the nation, this nation, with, with drugs. 
his son Emiliano is an ardent member, and despite his protestations, despite the fact that he says now that ranieri has been arrested, that he has uh, abandoned the company, that's just a facade. He's still in hook, line, and sinker. Interesting. And then uh, there was also a, a DC socialite, a daughter of DC socialites, Pam Kafritz, too. So there's connections there to DC, and she's passed away. One of the interesting stories is her. Uh, uh, Ranieri believes and wanted to cryogenically freeze two of his former members. Is that too, true? Uh, at least two, yeah. The, both uh, Pam and uh, Pam Kafritz and uh, Barbara Jeske. Gotcha. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, they wanted Jeske's body. The family wouldn't give it. They asked for just her head. We really wanted just to have he uh, he was denied. But in the case of Kafritz, he did get her body. He kept it for a fact. And for a fact, he kept her after she died in a bathtub with ice, while he made arrangements to cryogenically freeze her. So do you, do you know at this time if she's in the cryogenic uh, freeze place? I suspect that she is. I do not know that for a fact. Her death was a mysterious death, too, and he may have um, taken certain actions to expedite her death because um, he had uh, control of some of her money. Interesting. So that would would prevent her from getting treatment? Correct. He he took over her medical care. Wow, that's terrifying. Um, <clears throat> so another thing that was interesting is somehow he was able to get the Dalai Lama or Dalai Lama to go to New York. Is that correct? That is true. I was there when the original arrangements were made. What were those arrangements? One million dollars paid to the Dalai Lama. Interesting. So the Dalai Lama took that money and what, what was the whole, how did that meeting, you know, play out? Well, I, when I was originally asked about the wisdom of this, I advised against it because I didn't think it would make a good fit. But Claire and Keith had ordered Claire and Sara to um, to get the Dalai Lama and have the Dalai Lama come and endorse him as a great teacher of ethics. And the Dalai Lama, you know, in a constant need for money, uh, accepted the million, and he began. It began well enough, but then it backfired as the press started crying foul. This was after I was fired. I wasn't there to, um, I wasn't being listened to, and I wasn't there to help. They got crucified in the press. The Dalai Lama received quite a bit of criticism with the, the, the uh, gist of the criticism, why would Dalai Lama be endorsing a cult? Uh, he backed away. He canceled the engagement. Ranieri was frantic. He flew to Dharmasal, India, to uh, plead with the Dalai Lama to come. I believe another million dollars of Brahman money was paid to the Dalai Lama, and he did make an appearance with the Brahman sisters and Ranieri on stage in Albany in 2009. Wow, that's incredible. And then I think that one of the people who was involved kind of uh, as an antagonist of Nexium was Rick Allen Ross, who was a kind of cult uh, deprogrammer maybe, but he was able to extract some information that had previously been, been private. Do you know about that? Yes, I know about his case. He was the original, he and Tony Natale were the original enemies of Nexium, and when I was working there, they were both being... Uh, hounded and pursued by by Ranieri with the Brothman Millions. So, so Rick had all he did was uh, Keith, Keith had fleeced a man named Michael Sutton, a uh, uh, heir of the um, what was it the Lollycogs Garment Industries. Morris Sutton, Michael Sutton was his son, and and Michael uh, was fleeced and stripped of his wealth by Ranieri. His tr- Michael's troubled sister went to Rick Ross, and Ross tried to deprogram unsuccessfully. He then published as a warning to the world on a fairly early internet, 2000, 
two or three website exposing some of the details of Ranieri's creepy cult. Ranieri sued him, and the litigation went on for 14 years. Wow. Ranieri spent more than $10 million of Brothman's money, and in the end, he lost. Incredible. What was the settlement? What was the, what was the judgment? Well, you know, the judgment was kept sealed, but the, the case was dismissed by mutual agreement after all this money was spent. And Ross prevailed, and in some ways it's historic, because some of the fair use um, law that we have that surrounds the Internet was precedent made by Ross's case. Ross stuck it out. He wouldn't back down. He's not the type of man to back down. And um, he prevailed. The stuff that he published is fair use. It's, uh, it's not copyright if you publish a little bit of something about a organization's teachings in order to show the public um, its potential benefits or dangers. Interesting. So that's now memorialized in a court of law somewhere in New York then, huh? That judge, that fair use judgment. So it's you know, it started right. in New York. It's actually it's federal. I think it was it's federal law, and it ended up in New Jersey. Jersey. But it is uh, it's, it's precedent, right? He right. Was, he, he, Ranieri by by trying to suppress the First Amendment actually strengthened it, thanks to the good offices of uh, Rick Allen Ross. Oh, remarkable, yeah. But he the stuff he published, I can't. Re- I don't remember. It was somewhat scandalous. Do you recollect he published something that did not look good for Ranieri, right? That is correct. Yeah. He had two, two um, prof- professionals, one was a psychiatrist and one was a psychologist, who, using course material that Ranieri claimed was purloined, um, they were able to write critiques that were devastating to Ranieri. Gotcha. And at the time, I advised Ranieri that if he just let it go, he, he could not, if he did not sue Ross, there would be a website with some criticism, and he could create websites where he could advance the positive side. But he couldn't. He had this this vengeance that was that consumed him. Remarkable. He had to fight Ross. Wow, that's remarkable. That's a remarkable piece to this very long story. We are coming to the end of the hour. We're at about 53 minutes. Uh, is there a way people can go and see your writing? Uh, on the fr- I think it's the frankreport.com, right? That is correct. Come to the frankreport.com and you can, if you're interested in this kooky, crazy, despicable, dangerous cult, you can keep updated since I post regularly on the latest uh, events. Yeah, you have some remarkable material there, so I do com- recommend listeners go to the frankreport.com and take a look. At so many aspects to this story, you know, there's so many things going on, moving parts that, uh, you know, uh, Frank has been following the story diligently. So there's really some great material there. Again, Frank Parlato, thank you very much for being on the show. It's my great pleasure. I enjoyed it. And thank you for your having me on the show.